Hello, my name is Alan Foom, and today I'm going to talk about carbon capture storage business models. So this is another one of my basic primer series looking at uh, energy. So what is CCUS? Now I have a video on CCUS, a basic primer, which talks a lot more about the technical side of it. But basically you have uh, large point emitters, so for example, petrochemical plants, thermal energy plants, that uh, where you capture the CO2 from the flues of these plants. You then process it transport it and then you bury it in the ground in geological sequestration either in depleted gas fields or aquifers or other uh, methods so i talk about all about that in my video on the on the subject which i'll link in the end screens uh, status of ccus so here you have existing facilities so there are quite a lot in north america uh, lula in brazil a couple in uh, in europe some in the middle east couple in China, one in Australia, but a lot more under development. So all over USA and Canada, quite a lot in Europe, a few in Southeast Asia, a few more in China. So this is from the Global CCS Institute. So potentially over 100 projects, either in advanced development, or early development, 11 projects in construction, it's about 30 projects operational. So the business model for CCU uh, US. Basically, it's a waste management business. So a large emitter is charged a cost of producing CO2. CO2 contributes potentially to climate change, according to the majority of scientists. Uh, you need to reduce emissions. So how do you do it? Well, you can buy CO2 credits, so effectively it costs you more. Um, you can reduce emissions through efficiency technology. That may or may not be possible in some areas. You can get a CO2 storage company to store the CO2 for you. Uh, now, which is what I'm talking about today. So. In this situation, transport company charges a fee to move the CO2 from here to here, and a storage company sequestrates CO2 gets paid a fee for doing this. So if the fee for storing the CO2 is less than the other alternatives, that's what's going to go ahead. Government's been quite keen to support CCS. So in some cases you've got free market and the United States, Canada. Then you've got some more regulation, so United Kingdom, Denmark, and then you've got full state control. So places like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, where you've got straight owned energy giants that want to reduce the carbon footprint. Now, government support can include various financial incentives, grants, subsidies, preferential loans, tax relief, or direct investment by state owned corporations. Or you can have regulatory incentives, basically a license to operate, no CCUS, no project. Regulatory support, carbon price support, operationing permits, R&D support, tax penalties for emitters, etc. So the government has carrots and sticks to uh, try to encourage this particular technology to try to help reduce our CO2 emissions. Levelized cost of CO2 versus avoidance. So you have uh, some situations here, such as natural gas plants, ammonia plants, hydrogen plants, which uh, where the cost of CCUS is less than the average price of carbon um, which is this uh, uh, green line here. But in some important fields such as steel and cement, which emit a lot of CO2 and are very hard to abate, as for other things, doesn't quite work that way. Now, what do you do about it? Whether you do various subsidies, etc., is, uh, is another uh, question. And these are potential costs of CO2 storage from the IEA. So again, we need to try to get a situation where the costs go lower or this goes up. The problem with this going up is that it damages heavy industry and makes it less competitive. It reduces uh, the uh, um, wealth of a country. Um, there's a report uh, by the Oxford Institute of Energy Studies on CCS business models. Please check it out. It's free. It's available on their website. So I've taken some stuff from here and I've uh, used that as a primer for my explanations. So first model is a single chain. Uh, so effectively you have a single entity, single point source, for example, a high CO2 gas field, LNG plant, etc., transported locally and stored locally. It tends to be operated by the same consortium that controls the field. Now, many of the examples that you see here, such as the Gorgon project in Australia, um, operated by Chevron, Snowvid project operated by Equinor, Slightly field um, operated by Equinor as well, and the Lula field in Brazil operated by Petrobras, these two, the two fields, basically have got very high CO2 gas, uh, which needs to be stored, um, basically as licensed to operate, where these two projects, again, are high point, point emitters in countries where they're concerned a lot about CO2 emissions, and it's a way of burying those emissions safely in the ground. 
The key point here is a slice and stop rate. If you don't do CCS, you may not be allowed to do your project. Next stage, uh, which are quite a few of the projects being developed now, is a situation where you have a hub and spoke model. So you have an industrial cluster, you have a hub, which gathers the CO2 then and transports it, transports it to one storage site. And you tend to work on long-term contracts. So effectively, you will have a steel plant and they will have a 25-year contract to capture their CO2. Obviously, a key thing there is that you need a stable price of CO2 for 25 years for the investment to take place or stable regulation for that length of time. It's long-term business. So example here is Acorn, CCUS in Scotland. So you've got an industrial cluster here in central Scotland. It's pipe to Peter Head, just north of Aberdeen, which is a terminal for quite a lot of the pipelines from the uh, northern North Sea. And then you've got burial here in the Captain Fairway uh, with a golden eye field. Um, Fred of and Baron was involved with this uh, particular project. And also um, the May Sandstone, Palestine Sandstone, a bit further out. Operated by a company called Storigo, very interesting company, growing a lot in, uh, in CCUS. Uh, joint venture partners are Shell, big energy giant harbor, quite a large energy company that no one's ever heard of, but they're very, very big in, uh, in the North Sea. And North Sea um, midstream partners as joint venture partners. So again, due to start up in 2030, 5 million tons a year, capturing quite a large percentage of uh, Scotland's industrial CO2. Then you have a slightly more advanced model, which is the uh, hub and multiple storage sites, multiple capture sites. So basically an aggregator. So again, you've got long-term storage contracts, multiple CO2 storage companies compete for the business from the hub. And one useful example are these people called Talos Energy. Now, there's been a late, really very recent development, um, which I learned as, as part of writing this, uh, this video, which is uh, 18th of March, which is three days ago from when I'm making this video today. Um, Talos announced the sale of the CCUS business to Total Energy, a big multinational. But uh, we'll look at their model because it's still a very valid model. So you've got two sides of the model. You've got the production side, and then you've got the CO2 capture side. And these are some of the projects that have been involved. So this is along the Gulf Coast of the United States. So this is New Orleans, this is Houston. Again, quite a lot of industrial clusters, quite a lot of refineries, petrochemical plants, etc., and some uh, new LNG export plants. So quite a lot of potential uh, CO2 emitters that uh, people would need to try to get rid of. And they've got various partners, Chevron, Equinor, uh, Starigo, which I mentioned earlier. Um, again, some big companies and small companies that are involved in trying to make this thing work. A couple of examples of their projects. So this is Bayou Bend. So this is uh, Baytown, Beaumont in um, the boundary between Texas and Louisiana. So you've got uh, some offshore storage sites and you've got some on land storage sites. So these are owned by um, basically landowners because mineral rights in the US are owned by uh, private individuals. This also applies to CCUS rights and the looking at developing various storage sites for these industrial clusters in Baytown and Port Arthur, Beaumont and Texas. Another one is Harvest Bend. So this is uh, along the Mississippi near New Orleans and Baton Rouge. Again, these are potential sites on land. And this is looking at uh, using all of these petrochemical plants and other heavy industry plants in along the Mississippi, trying to bury their CO2. But things don't always go smoothly in CO2. Now, this is an example, again, this came in, uh, in recently. So this is a Porto project in the Netherlands. So this is uh, Rotterdam. This is a uh, depleted gas field out just off the coast of, uh, of uh, the, the Netherlands. Um, and it's run significantly over budget. And the reason for that, to some extent, is cost inflation, but also a situation where you've had a lot of campaigning by a particular group talking about nitrogen emissions, which apparently is a big issue in the Netherlands. But this led to a lot of delays, a lot of cost overruns. Now you've got a very slim margin business. This is going to be quite difficult. So a key point here is you need excellent project management, which the oil and gas industry is not quite that good at. You need excellent cost control. Again, we've got a problem within that. You need effective public engagement. So three things, let's be honest, we need to pull our socks up on as an industry to try to make these things work. Other business models are slightly more advanced. So this again is from Oxford Institute. You've got multiple emitters, multiple transports, etc. This is a full free market. Not sure if this has happened yet. I'm not sure quite that's going to happen, but you need a mature market with stable regulation. 
We're not on a mature market yet, but this might be the future. So what are the barriers to CCUS growth? So you've got the business commercial barriers. So you've got high upfront capex. You need a cost control need, really high performance in terms of project management, project delivery. You've got the uncertainty in CO2 price. You need long-term stability to justify an investment. You're going to have to have a 15, 20, 25, 30-year contract. That's a fairly long time for many industries, so there's a situation there. And we've got competition from alternative decolonization technologies and business models. And we've got low margins. There's some technical situations and that technology has been demonstrated. There's some long-term containment risk, but we can manage that. CO2 is pretty corrosive. You need special steel and cement. There's some small risk uh, from leakage to cap wells. And again, risk throughout the structure migration. We monitor that. That can be handled, but again, we need to mention that that risk is there. Regulatory risk. So you need uniform regulations. Again, uh, these tend to vary, sometimes within states and provinces, particularly states in the USA. Um, and it can change, which in long-term business is a bit of a problem. Now, we can manage that, but that's there. CO2 credits determine CO2 price. If some government suddenly starts issuing a lot of permits, CO2 price falls to the floor. CCUS becomes less competitive. Um, and there's a risk of sudden regulation change. Then there's a the political risk. So you need the support from governments. You need long-term commitment. This fundamentalist opposition from green fundamentalists who just don't want any CO2 emitting at all rather than trying to solve a particular problem. And we need to reassure the public. We need to reassure the public on safety, so demonstrating effective safe performance. We need to demonstrate environmental performance. And we need effective management with other stakeholders. Now that is quite a large task that we need to do and need to do effectively. So to summarize, CCUS is an important component in decarbonization. Several business models exist. Some are more advanced than others. The single point, single chain model is, is very much in existence. That accounts for the vast majority of projects already in existence. And that's basically licensed to operate. Um, others are less, less advanced, but uh, coming in the future. And it's part of our license to operate, license to basically do stuff. There's going to be more of that as people become more concerned about the environment. And it's not just going to be licensed to operate for oil and gas companies. It could be licensed to operate for cement works, licensed to operate for steel, etc. But depend on government regulation and effective government regulation and deployment on society acceptance. This technology has to be sold and has to be demonstrated and people need to be given reassurance. There's some countries more committed than others, and that's basically to do with their view on the whole carbon situation. Some people are more concerned about it as countries and societies than others. Um, how do you deal with one country which is less concerned than, than others with an open free market for the end result and products? So for example, you have a steel plant in a country that's less concerned about CO2, basically flooding the steel market in the world. You put up tariff walls and then you get trade walls and then everybody loses. Not a good situation. And fundamentally, it's a high capex, low margin business, and you need iron discipline to do things effectively. So thank you very much. Please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.